is the co-founder and the CEO of Seas. We've built something that 2.7 million people used. Like in startup world, you have to survive long enough to get lucky. I've met Elon Musk, by the way. You had longer with Elon Musk than you had with some guy in marketing. I got some people chasing me because like, why the <laughs> hell are you taking a picture of my car? The first car we ever sold was to a 72-year-old woman. The show is brought to you by Mini Cooper. By <laughs> At any point, if you ask yourself, what am I doing? Every morning, <laughs> there's been 35,000 startups that died in the last year. Have you learned any Danish? Yeah, just a few words. Just okay. so that you make sure yeah. they're not talking about you behind your Yeah, back. just the swear words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't tell you there are 10 lows for every one high. You're going global. You're yeah, going we are. What's harder, raising investments or raising kids? Wow. That's okay. a big intake. That's a big question. Big intake man. of breath, man. <laughs> <laughs>
and that was before AI chatbots became cool again. Now yeah. that was that was like seven years ago. So we did that. The app did pretty well. We got around 2.7, 2.8 million users in the UAE. Then we expanded to Saudi and Kuwait. That was when we met, I think, at the time. Yeah. And our business model at the time was selling data and, and, and doing all of that. And then by March 2020, the whole world stopped. No one was spending anything on marketing. We were very lucky. We had just closed the funding round in February 2020. Okay. Literally a month before COVID. So we had $6 million in the bank and then the world shut down. So that was, that was fortunate. And we had to decide, do we keep doing what we're doing? Do we, like most companies, cut our costs, keep your head down and then come back afterwards? Yeah. Or do we really try to reinvent ourselves yeah. based on how we think the world is going to change after COVID? So we went with option two. And we felt there were two big trends happening in, in automotive industry. One, on the consumer side, more and more people were becoming open to buying cars online. And then on the dealer side, more and more dealers wanted to digitize their business, create e-commerce, do all that Cut stuff. costs. Cut costs, exactly. Do it cheaper, yeah. uh, better. So uh, we we had we, we were working with on a project with the RTA here in Dubai, the government. Yeah. And... Uh, they, they like to do world's first, and they wanted to build the world's first digital car registration over blockchain. Wow. So we ended up building that for them. And we announced it in a big tech conference here called Jitex. Yeah. And it happened that the CEO of Mercedes Europe was there. He saw it, and he's like, wow, this is the future. This is really cool. Give me your card. And then he calls me. He not, doesn't email me. He calls me two weeks afterwards. He's old school. <laughs> He calls me and he's like, listen, I want to connect you with one of our big dealer groups in Denmark. They want to reinvent themselves. Do you want to talk to them? I'm like, of course. My co-founder is Danish. The first four engineers we hired were Danish. So we always had that connection to Denmark. Yeah. So we started working with that dealership. Long story short, we built a software for them to digitize their business. Then the second biggest dealer in Denmark came. And then now we have 20 in Denmark. We opened in Italy. We Put in Switzerland. And right, that's what we do, basically. You're going global. You're yeah, going, we are. Mate, we congrats. Are. So Thank seven you. years ago, your life changed, right? right. And you, you named the company Seas. Yeah. I'm guessing because you see the car or you want to... You seize and capture it as you well. You seize and you capture it. Yeah, and you're yeah. capturing, obviously, a lot of data. So exactly. nice, nice play on words. Yeah. Um, so do you regret any points in those last seven years? <laughs> because you were in a management consultancy yeah. before, right? You were PwC, is that right? So yeah, I'll give you my background. So I started my career in consulting with okay. a company called Booz & Co. at the okay. time. They later became called Strategy Ant. They okay. were bought by PwC. Yeah. Then I got into investment banking with Deutsche Bank in London, doing mergers and acquisitions. Came back to Dubai in 2007. Yeah. The mug. Yeah. <laughs> and I worked in something called private equity, which is also investments where you buy companies, grow them, and sell them. And then I went to that. Abu Dhabi entity called the Assad, the satellite company. Yeah. And then I did this, yeah. So I've been corporate all my life prior to that. Mate, it's, it's a very impressive CV yeah, thanks. That, that you have. <laughs> um, so going back to my original question, seven years since you started the company, at any point have you asked yourself, what am I doing? Like every morning, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. Like it's, 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 it's a tough journey. I mean, yeah. do I regret it? No. Yeah. But is it hard and do I ask myself, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Like yeah. every day. You know? But it's a seismic shift. You go from a corporate world yeah. where, you know, you're, without saying too much, you're, you're, a, you're just a cog in a very, very big machine. Yeah. So then becoming, you're the machine itself. You become yeah. your own cog and it's, you're hiring people, you bring people on board. Yeah. It's a huge weight of moral responsibility as much as yeah. financial responsibility. How do yeah. you, how do you deal with something like that? So, the biggest changes I felt, so, so one, you lose all the support around you, right? You don't have yeah. an office and a, you know assistant and whatever. You're everything, right? And all the you know, equity you've built for yourself as, as, a, as a senior guy in, in the corporate world disappears, goes down to zero. Yeah. And I was working in investments, so usually people are nicer to you because you're investing money and millions into whatever. You're making doing. the money as well, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, the, the, the people you make money, you're the one who's nice to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the people you're, you're giving the money to are, are the ones who are nicer to you. And then you go to like literally nothing. So I I'm, I'm find myself in the middle of TCOM, like waiting in the lobby for like a 20-year-old guy who's a marketing 
dude in a, in yeah. a, in a car you hate company. That. You hate that, don't you? I hated it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting there and You're just like, swallowing the pride. Just swallowing. Listen all to this true story. He comes in, he's 40 minutes late. Yeah. And he's like, listen, I have only 10 more minutes. Do you want to do it now or you want to postpone? I'm like, no, I want to do it now. I'll take the 10 minutes. It's, and it's, it's literally that, right? So you swallow your pride, you go down to zero and you start from there. The other big change that I felt, obviously financially, I took a 70, 80% pay cut, so that hurts. But then the only, the, the, the other big change I felt is when you're in corporate, you don't have to do everything. You have to do what you do. And usually this is what you do well when, you know, when you progress in your career. Yeah. In startups, you have to do everything. And even the stuff you don't want to do, you don't like to do, like, you know, going and set up, setting up a company or, you know, finding rent and, and yeah. doing all the tax stuff and VAT, no one else is going to do it. Yeah. Like, it's the only place where if you don't do it, it just... But how falls. much do you learn about yourself, but also about, you know, the, the whole new world of startups? It Absolutely. must have been a dramatic learning curve. Absolutely. And this is the best part of it. Like, I think, you know, the best part is just how much you learn about yourself and, you know, how far would you go and how, how resilient you are and need to be. And you'll learn about all this other random stuff like admin and tax and government. Yeah. I don't know how useful it is yeah. <laughs> later on in life, but you learn it. Yeah. So why did you do it? What was the reason? Was it, was it a push out of the corporate or was it the pull of doing something? Good yourself? question. Uh, let me tell you how, how I moved in my career and I think it'll explain this. So... When I was in consulting, you make good money in consulting, but everybody there is like, oh, you know, we make good money, but investment bankers make the same money, but they get bigger bonuses, right? So, hmm, I want the bigger bonuses. I'm working like 14 hours a day. Why not, right? Yeah. So I moved into investment banking. And then everybody at the time in investment banking wanted to go into private equity because in private equity, you get the salary, yeah. you get the bonus, but then you get something called carry on top, which is a piece of the profit of the carry deals you on make. top, right? Yeah. It's basically a cherry on top, effectively. Basically, yeah. yeah. But, a big, <laughs> but a big cherry, yeah. and it can be it can be sizable, right? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I want that. So yeah. I went back to that, and then I went into private equity and venture capital, and there you start seeing so many entrepreneurs, and you like you meet them and their energy and the yeah. ideas they have and all that, and it drops off on you, and then you're like, you know, if if I want to keep challenging myself. This is the ultimate challenge. Like, like every job I've had, you know, you rely on the company's name, on the company's, yeah. you know, credibility and all that. This would be like you, right? And I felt if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. How old were and you when? How old were you? So I was around 36. Okay. And you were obviously you were married. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you had how many children at that point? So I had one kid and I had just had my second kid. Okay, so and you're not in the most, you know, no. you've got a lot of responsibilities, yeah. you've got a young family. But it's okay. always like, I think if you want to find an excuse, you'll always find one, yeah. right? Like it's always be like, ah, you know, I need to save up a bit more money. I have, you know, I just had my And next there's never kid. enough money. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. oh, how much is enough for you to then save? So, you know, exactly. I'm comfortable and I can push on. But exactly. it's a brave decision you took. It is, it is. And, and yeah, once you do it, like you... I don't think you look back like it's it's I don't have a problem. So a lot of founders have a problem going back to corporate. They say, oh, once you do this, you'll never work for anyone again. I've been so in corporate for so long. <laughs> I'm actually OK going back someday if I have to. But you don't look back. You just feel like, OK, this is this is what I want to do. And you just keep going. Like uh, I'll give you a really nice quotation. A friend of mine said so I, I, I used to drive because my last job was in Abu Dhabi with the government thing. And we got a house there. And then when I started C's here, I would drive up and down from Abu Dhabi. Like, like when I met you, I was doing that. So I listened to a lot of audiobooks, like like 360 audiobooks or something. Yeah. And my best phrase or quote is from none of these books. It's a friend of mine. Like uh, he has a startup in, in France and he said it to me. So like in startup world, you have to survive long enough to get lucky, right? And I think it's, it's the best summary of startup life because basically... When it does happen for you, there's a huge angle of luck. I right? love it. I love it. But your job is to survive long enough to be in the right place at the right time when, you know, the thing happens. And, and that's what you keep doing every day as a startup founder. Right? So how long does it take really to make a business profitable? Because you, you keep hearing, oh, if you can survive the first two or three years, you kind of get a... Is there, is there any math in that? Is there any yeah. science in that? Or does it, you know, is it irrelevant of what category or industry you're in? 
I know there isn't a number. I mean, it, it depends on a billion things. So first, it depends how fast you're growing and how fast you want to grow. And the faster you want to grow, the longer it'll take for you to become profitable. Um, so psychologically, how how have you, how have you coped with that? From being somebody who you know you're making good money, I'm guessing you're being very successful in all the jobs that you're going to to doing something brand new, right from scratch, starting ground zero effectively. Uh, without the cash support, right, the income support, how do you deal with that psychologically? So I, I don't think enough people talk about the psychological side for founders. Like it's so. Seems let's talk like about it, Tar. Let's talk about let's it. Let's do it, man. Uh, it's it's bad. It's stressful as hell. Like they say, you know, when you talk to people about how does it feel to be a founder and all that, they always say the highs are so high and the lows are so low, and it's true. They don't tell you there are 10 lows for every one high, right? <laughs> like the ratio is now one You to don't one. get a book, <laughs> how to be a founder, how to deal with it. Exactly, no one, give, no one no. gives you that book, right? And it's mostly bad stuff, right? Yeah. And as a CEO, you deal with the worst stuff because all the small bad things, your team handles them. Yeah. So the things that rise up to you are really yeah. the worst of the worst. And, yeah. and that's where you can add value. So you're constantly just seeing problems and bad stuff. Yeah. How do you deal with it? You just... You figure out a way, right? Like you can do sports, meditate, talk to people. Yeah, I love talking to other founders. Like we have like you know bitching do you, sessions. You're, do you want to? You have a massive WhatsApp group of founders. Just have a chat with each other. There are so many of these, but that's not where you really like okay. get the value. The value is when you go grab coffee with a guy who's almost crying. <laughs> yeah. So you actually have WhatsApp groups. I was actually joking. There you are, actually have WhatsApp yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot. <laughs> Maybe two or three. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, you figure out a way to really yeah. just de-stress and, you know, you do get these highs every now and then that keep you going. Sometimes you, you think like the biggest problem is you're like, okay, this is not a billion dollar company yet. Yeah. Is it getting there? Because yeah. basically you don't know whether the lows are Worth the it. natural lows in the yeah. journey or they're lows because things are never going to become yeah. good yeah. again. Also, is it worth, is it worth taking all is of this, all these blows that you keep taking down? Yeah. Do you think, okay, do you lose faith? Do you lose hope that this company is ever going to be successful? You do sometimes. You do for sure. And I think what keeps you going is the fact that you've taken other people's money and you're like, okay, I'm not just going to drop it and leave. You have your team like that will be jobless if you stop. And then you have the vision, right? Like you... You do believe in the vision, obviously. You can't not believe in your own vision if you're the founder. And you're like, I see it. Like it, it, it feels close enough that it can happen. The thing is, the way you're describing it, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've tried to empathize as much as possible prior to this chat. Why do people do it then? Why do you take on all of these difficulties, all of these challenges, all the obstacles? Why do people have their own, set up their own businesses? Listen, if you look at the stats, it's like one out of 100, you know, makes it big, right? In the startup world. Any game, anything you ever play in the world, if you had 1% chance and 90, 99% chance, it's not gonna work, you'd never play that game. Yeah. Like only a crazy person would yeah. choose to roll the dice where he has a 1% chance of working, right? I think it's, it's either a vision that they believe in or a personal challenge that they want to go through. And once you start, like the good, the good founders have, you know, they keep going. It's, it feels like, like you're sitting on a tiger and it's mm. running and at some points you don't want to be on that freaking tiger. And but at the same time, if you get off, you're like, oh, well, the tiger eats me. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> hang, hang on and keep is it going. Addictive? Is, there, is there a part of it where you're like, you see it's a little bit of movement or a little bit of success and that gives you and fuels yeah, you to want to do more. 100%. So you, you need those small, like if it's 100% crap, yeah. you're going to give up. Yeah. So it's those it's small those crumbs that wins, you get yeah, along the, the crumb, way. The crumbs like, keep ah, you going. Yeah, they yeah. feed you. Like uh, I, I find myself telling my team like so often the next six months are the yeah. <laughs> make it or break it six months for us. And then it, it gets moved. So right? now that you're a founder, do you, can you, when you look at people, do you, do you sort of think you could be an entrepreneur? You could be a founder. Do you, does it take a certain type of skill set, a certain type of mindset, a certain type of personality that you can see and say, you know what, that person has it. That person probably could never have it. <sighs> Good question. Like I think, Takes so many small characteristics. It's not one thing. So you can see a guy who's like who has the vision, whatever. But does he have the hustle to keep going when everything's going badly? I don't know. And some people are hustlers, but they don't have the vision. Uh, so I think it takes a you know a group of of, of you know characteristics combined together to to make you 
go yeah. the distance. By the way, I, I didn't ask you before, do you have a safe word? Usually on my show, I give my guests a chance to have a safe word. Uh, if there's a line of questions that they don't like, they're like, no, oh, take it easy. Do you have a safe word in mind? Yeah, it's uh, elephant. So elephant. So I saw an elephant here in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elephant. Plays nicely. So, so my next question is, how was your wife during all of this? Because you know, go back seven years, she's just had a baby, a second baby. Yeah, you've been, you know, you've been earning a comfortable living, I'm guessing, and then you go and tell her and say, look, honey, I'm taking an eighty percent pay cut. Oh. Uh, how you know? How was she? How was she supporting you during this period? surprisingly super supportive like uh, she's she's not a very materialistic person and she understood that i want to do this and i yeah. and and she saw some benefits out of it as well i controlled my own time like so there are like you know family so wise changing there. diapers or something. yeah that's exactly. what that, she was that's <laughs> so what here you go yeah. <laughs> and if you could go back in time seven years ago and what would piece of advice would you give yourself Wow, that's okay. a big intake. That's a big question. Big intake of breath, man. <laughs> <laughs> Except, uh, that's a good question. What what advice would I give myself? Because I don't have regrets in terms of like don't do it or anything yeah. like that. It wouldn't be like keep cranking at it because I did that anyway. I think I would have, knowing now what happened in the economy and all that, so it's very specific to to what happened. It's not a personal thing, but. I would have tried to focus on profitability earlier in the journey. I think we started late and it, it yeah. delayed a lot of things because the world wasn't focusing on that previously. Okay. I think if we had focused on that initially, we'd be in a different place. But now. from a personal perspective, so yeah, what would you tell yourself, right? You got a, you got a younger Tarek sitting next to you. Yeah, I would have just told him, dude, <laughs> it's gonna take ten years. It's not gonna take three years before this thing happens. Because I, I, you know, you hear all the stories. This company started and one year later they got bought by Facebook for a billion dollars and yeah. whatever. You think the timeline is shorter. And every founder who starts, I don't think any of them thinks it's a 10-year journey, but the average time is actually 10 years. Yeah. So you start off thinking it's the four-year gig, yeah. but you need to be ready for 10 years. Okay. So what's the ambition of the company? What, 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 do you, I'm guessing you want to you want to sell it off at one yeah. day. You know you want to you want to cash in. Yeah. You know, but how long how long is that day? When is that going to happen? And so what do you need to happen before that actually takes place? So I think we're venture back, so we got money from venture capital companies. So we have to exit at some point, right? So we have to sell, and so that is that is where it's it's, it's going to be. Uh, where do we need to be? I think we need to get to a certain size in terms of revenue and become profitable before that becomes as big as we'd like it to be. Because no matter how big you get, if you're not profitable, the value you get for your company is, is, is smaller. Yeah, We need to be an international business, which I think we're close to becoming now. So it's not just a one country game. It's a scalable business that can be in multi countries. Yeah. We took a big bet on ChatGPT when it first started. And we ended up being the only automotive company doing something meaningful in that space. Yeah. So that part felt like we were in the right place at the right time. So we want to double down on that, and and it's now like yeah. this is where you know everything is happening in ChatGPT. So I think by end of next year we'll have a good view on when we're exiting, yeah. how we're going to look like, how much it's going to be, and all that. Okay, now fast forward, right? You've just sold, you okay. just sold the company. Okay, you've made a lot of money. See you guys. Bye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the first thing you're going to do? <sighs> Take a vacation. <laughs> look at that. Take Take another vacation. Intake. Take another breath. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't taken a vacation in like longer than four days in seven years. Oh, mate. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take a vacation. That's not good, is it? It's not good. But I mean, I know what people usually tell you, dude, take a vacation, switch off. And, and it's not, I can, it's not that I can't, but I don't know how to switch off. And I think the vacation would be wasted <laughs> by me being on a vacation, not working and not fully switching off. Like when I'm on a plane, almost get a heart attack if I can't connect to Wi-Fi because I'm thinking, and it's not because I want to answer instantly, but because I'm thinking if I wait eight hours till the time I land, I'm going to have a billion messages and emails and yeah. That's that the, stresses me. Yeah. Right? Thinking about your wife, she hasn't had a holiday in seven years. So she, she yeah, I mean, 
Not with a, you, not, she hasn't had a holiday a with you. Not a for a long one, no. Mate, you, the first yeah. thing you should do, you, should, you need to do something Take for her. Take her with yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. You're right. Um, right, as usually in my in my show, I have a um, an improv section, okay? okay. It's uh, effectively, it's a bag which has lots of balls in it. And on okay. each ball, there is a certain topic that we'll have a chat about, okay? okay. Um, so uh, let's do that. If you're up let's for it, it, let's do it. Yeah, Let's do it, yeah. Okay, here's the bag. I'm going to chuck okay. it over to you. Yeah. Have a, have a read through. And uh, we'll take it from there. Just pick one randomly, yeah? Pick one randomly. Read, read, it, read it? it out for us, please. Biggest misconception about starting a business. Okay. All right. Biggest misconception about starting a business is going to be quick. It's going to be easy. And you're going to become a millionaire very quickly. Okay. Like, and that's never the case. It's never the case, no. Ever. <laughs> is there, is there a, when, you, when you're starting it, do you, people always tell me, there are so many things you never even thought of that you end up happening to do, right? And yeah. your list of five or 10 things suddenly becomes 50 yeah. and 100. Yeah. Um, but it puts you into areas that you are feel a little bit uncomfortable about yourself. But again, the learning benefit that you get is tremendous, I'm guessing. So sometimes, like, so a good example of that, for, for me at least, was people management, right? So I've managed teams in my previous job, like five, six, seven, ten people, right? Yeah. And the profile of the people you manage are usually similar to you. Like if you're yeah. in finance, it's a team of finance people, right? Yeah. But here I'm managing tech developers and I don't come from that background. Like in my previous job, I was like, okay, we give you a good bonus. You work on a high profile deal. You can work, yeah. you know, 25 yeah. hours a day. We're good. That's yeah. that's how we motivate people. Yeah, I came here and I'm hired tech people, Danish tech people. <laughs> no, you love it. Have you learned any Danish, by the way? <laughs> Sorry. Have you learned any Danish? Yeah, just a few words. Just like so I, that you make sure yeah. they're not talking about you behind your yeah, back. Yeah, just the swear words. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, and it's totally different. I mean, I I had no idea how to incentivize them. Like like yeah. one of our ex employees, he left. Took a year off. Changed his name to Forrest. Okay. 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 Great name. <laughs> he didn't want the name his parents gave him. He's like, okay. why should I take that? Yeah. I don't know how to deal with people like that. Like <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 I've never yeah. done that, right? So yeah. I had to deal with these guys. So when you're hiring, when you're bringing people on to the company, what are the things that you're, that you're looking for? The number one thing I look for, ironically, is not skill set and all that. It's people who have a sense of ownership. Right, and I think that is the best thing you can have in, in, a, in a person on your team. Nice. It's people who genuinely have ownership in the company that that think about yeah. the company at one a.m. and send them as saying, "I got this crazy idea. How about we do this kind of stuff?" Yeah. Versus people who just go do. The, they might do the job well, but without that ownership, especially in a startup, you can't like because basically one of your biggest advantages you don't have more money than the big companies. You have smaller teams. All you have is heart, right? Yeah. Like the big company, the guys are leaving at 5 p.m. and not thinking about the company. Yeah. Your guys are really, you know. Yeah. And it's not about working longer hours. It's about just having that sense of like, this is mine. I want to make it happen. Let's I do know. another ball. Yeah. You like my bag of balls? I like your bag of balls. <laughs> All right. Uh, strangest insight seen from your customer data. Yeah, because you, you're sitting on a lot of data, right, in your, in your company. Yeah. Have you ever seen, like, or seen information or data that's just like, that's a bit strange, that's a bit odd? People are interested in things that you would never have imagined, or, you know, they're doing things with the data that's very strange. Yeah, like, uh, I know how interesting it is, but, like, we found it weird. So we launched an online car buying marketplace in Denmark where you can go and buy a car fully online. So you go do your thing, and then the car arrives at your house in three days. It's registered in your name. It's yeah. like you're ordering yeah. food almost, right? We did so much work on, you know, the persona and the customer segments and all of that and you know, research and surveys and stuff. And we're like, okay, we think, you know, with very good confidence, our customer segment is males between the age of 25 and 35. The first car we ever sold was to a 72-year-old woman. <laughs> <laughs> the second car we sold was for a 57-year-old woman who's a school teacher. Can I ask, what was a 72-year-old woman? Yeah. What was she buying? What car? Do you remember? It was a Mitsubishi. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
But yeah, so it yeah. like totally threw yeah. us off. And then yeah. in retrospect, you go and try to make sense of the day. They're like, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. 72 year old woman doesn't want to go to the showroom. She yeah. wants the car to come. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't want to haggle and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was that was a you know total shift from what we actually anticipated. The um the customer data point is interesting because I've seen and I've heard from I've got a lot, a lot of car clients in the past I've worked with. They're saying the younger generation don't have the same interest in wanting to buy a car mm. uh, as per se me and you, right? All they yeah. care about is mobility, getting from point A to B. Yeah. Uh, have you seen anything like that in the data? Are younger people less interested yeah. in going out and buying uh, buying cars, interested in brands? They're more interested in just the the functionality. Yeah, so yes, I know. So basically, younger people are more inclined not to own big assets in general, right? Like they, they don't want to buy stuff and all that. Just from a personality, they're like, okay, you know, I want the flexibility. I want to be able to be mobile and all that. But if you look at the actual, this is what they say, right? But yeah. if you look at the actual data, yeah. home ownership now for this generation is actually more than our generation so oh, the wow. younger guys are buying more houses so what they're saying what versus what they're doing they're is not, different they yeah. say they want the flexibility but when the time comes they are actually Same. buying stuff they might be they might be less interested in the brands yeah. so that is true so they don't care as much about the bmw and the mercedes cars and all that they might buy a chinese electric car yeah. but they still want to own the car because owning a car is not it's not about yeah, you want to go from A to B and, and all that, but you want that flexibility. You want, like, yeah. I want to get in, go now. I don't want to know, oh, is there an Uber? And, oh, there's a conference now, and it's going to take 20 minutes for my Uber to come yeah. out. So it gives you that freedom, yeah. and they value that freedom in yeah. a way. Do you have a favorite car brand? Are you allowed to say if you did? Yeah, like we... So my favorite car ever was, was the Audi R8. Okay. <laughs> so Fast car. it's not a brand, but it's yeah. just an actual car. I like it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, next pool. Yeah. I'm driving a, a Tesla now, by the way. Oh, look at you. I'd never go back, to be honest. All right. Like it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really cool drive. You have three seats left. Who do you take in your car? Yeah. So, you know the classic dinner, dinner party kind of question where you say, if you have three guests at dinner party, yeah. who would you invite? This is like you're driving a car, you're going on a long car journey. Okay. You could have anyone in that car, fictional, okay. non-fictional, past, present. Okay. Uh, you could have Stewie Griffin if you wanted. Okay. Like, who, who would who would be the three people filling up the car with you? Wow. Okay. Stewie would be a good one, but no. <laughs> uh, I'm in tech and all that, so so there's some some obvious answers there. So, I'd like to have Steve Jobs. I really obviously respect everything yeah. he's done and all that. What would you talk about with Steve? What would you ask him? Try to ask him about like you know his his crazy focus on product and and and, and you know the way he built things and all that. It's, yeah. it's there's so much learning you can get out of that. I still often watch like his small clips, share them with the team and all that. Like I haven't found a big tech guru with the same wisdoms. Like you know the guy has been gone for a while now. Yeah. People still watch his thirty second clips, yeah. and I don't find myself circulating stuff from Jeff Bezos or other people really. So, yeah. so I really like the way he looked at things. I would also probably have Elon Musk now because what he's doing from now onwards in the future, I like the space stuff he's doing a lot. Yeah, I'd like to understand you know, where he's going, why he wants to go there, what, what he sees the future for humanity. Yeah. Is. And to pick a fictional one just for fun. I like... Tyler Durden, do you know the guy? No, I don't. The guy is Brad Pitt in Fight Club. Uh, okay. One of my favorite characters in movies. So I'll probably have him there to really Just stir to things throw, up. Yeah, <laughs> throw a couple. So who sits yeah. next to you in the front seat? If you're driving, who's next to you? Not Tyler Durden. <laughs> <laughs> probably Steve Jobs. You'd have Steve with you in uh, the front. Okay. Yeah, my boy. And there'll be a fight in the back. <laughs> exactly. uh, what kind of music would you be listening to in the car? Uh... Probably alternative music. I'm a, I'm a 90s guy, so okay, classic. Like still what I so like. So a bit of the old Backstreet Boys. <laughs> exactly. Britney Spears. <laughs> Gotta love a bit of Britney. Um, and where would you be going, ideally? Where would the four of you be going? We'd be going to a really far away campsite somewhere. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, let's do another ball, mate. All right. I've met Elon Musk, by the way. Have you? Yeah. What's he like? 
This was a 20-minute meeting, but it was a business meeting. So, so yeah, wait, hold on. You had longer with Elon Musk than you had with some guy in marketing. Wait, <laughs> ten, we gave you 10 minutes. Exactly. Isn't that just crazy? <laughs> that's actually really cool. I should say that. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely crazy. Yeah. So what was it like with the meeting Elon? So we were, we were looking at using one of his launchers for a satellite as you do. company, as you yeah. naturally do. Yeah, he was there for 20. It was a room of like four people. Like, uh, so pretty intimate. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's good. He's taller than I thought he would be. He's he quite uh, big, buff guy. Quite big, yeah, uh, tall. Like, could you I'm take him? Him. him? Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> you could, you could. You're, you're, you're buffed recently. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, like everybody, like, how was he? Like 20 minutes, I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah. It was a good meeting. Would you want to have a beer with him? That's always the acid test, right? When you meet someone. If, if I'm not asking him about his vision and all that stuff, probably no. Okay. Like, like you know. Okay. Fair enough. Right, what does it say? What's the next one? What's harder, raising investments or raising kids? <laughs> Definitely raising kids at any given time, except for the last 12 months, raising money has been insane. So I read this, this stat yesterday, actually. There's been 35,000 startups that died in the last year, right? And it's, it's double the number by October. It's double the number from last year, right? So it's a really hard time to raise money. Like it's for a number of reasons, right? So you have the stock market, you know, the tech uh, stocks and all that crashing that yeah. like some of them down by 90%, like big multi-billion dollar companies, right? Crashing by 90%. So that's not helping. Then you have the whole recession looming, you know, all that stuff happening. It's not helping. Two wars now in the mix. Like it's it's just been a horrible time. It's been brutal. It's brutal. So rainbows and butterflies all around. Everywhere. So yeah, when you yeah. read this stuff, when you read thirty five thousand startups, you know, yeah. have been have been basically killed or yeah. you know dissolved. How how do you feel? I'm glad we're not one of them. So yeah. you do feel like whoo. Yeah. Thank God. Do you like feel like we, we must be doing that. something right? Where we're still going, we're still here, we're still surviving. To your earlier point. I have a problem feeling that. Like yeah. I'm, I'm always like, I have a problem saying, "Hey, great job!" Like yeah, you're hard really on good. yourself. Yeah, so it's always yeah. like, okay, okay, we we made it here. Let's go to the next one. Have you always been like that? I think so. I think so. It's uh, something I would like to learn how to change. But um, yeah, I'm pretty hard. Like, I was playing paddle with my wife and like another couple like two weeks ago, and, and we were losing. I didn't care at all. Wife was pissed. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, really. I'm like, dude, it's fine. Like, you learned how to get the ball now from the glass. That's actually great. Yeah. And she's like, no, but I want to win. I'm like, and I really didn't care. And I've been thinking about it ever since. I'm like, am I not competitive at all? But it's weird because I'm also like pushing and all doing all that stuff. Like, what is what is this? And I think I'm really competitive with myself. Like, I want to get beat my previous version of myself versus beat people on the outside. And so where does that come from, Tom? I think, so when I was a kid, like, I was close to my mom and it was very important for her to get good grades and be an overachiever. Like that was my way of giving back basically. And I think it comes from there. It's basically like, yeah, I always, you know, give something back, overachieve, because that's how people like your mom appreciates what you're giving her back or loves you or whatever. Like it comes from there. But Let's do another ball, buddy. All right. I think we've got one or two more, I think. Management consultants, fluff or something. <laughs> so management consultants, are they full of fluff or is it actual substance of what they're doing? Be, and I look, and, and, and really think about this because they, they don't have the best rep, right, okay. in general. Okay, full of fluff. And you, you <laughs> <laughs> I'll save Next you the question. time. <laughs> Next week. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what they do have. What they do have is they see so many companies at a global level, yeah. and that adds value to you, right? Yeah. The learnings they've had from there. But what typically they offer the most of yeah. is time. Like, it's the job they do. Their internal team in a big company can do the same job. They just don't have the time to do it and do their job, so they just come and do that for yeah. you, right? And then when, when you do a startup, you realize how much fluff there was on the other side, right? Like it's 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 all theory. There's no real go-to-market plan, no. no real accountability. Like this is what you should be doing, 
You know, it will right. drop it at 35,000 feet and, and we'll let the other guys it. figure out the operation. Most of them have never done anything, yeah. right? Like, because it feels like, uh, sound like, uh, risk of sounding like, uh, like a real butt here, but s between startups and management consultants, it feels like literally Boy Scouts <laughs> and a SWAT team. Yeah, <laughs> like Navy SEALs. It's, it's yeah. Navy SEALs, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, like it's that different, uh, right? Like, you're like, we're on the ground doing the work and whatever, and you're just like... Are you yeah. still in touch with some of your old buddies? I am, actually. Yeah. Like, so when I joined Booz a long time ago, 2003, it was the only management consultancy in the whole region, and I was employee number 64. Okay. And those 60 people from the time all went on to become, like, really cool stuff, right? Yeah. And I'm still in touch with, like, closely in touch yeah. with maybe seven, eight of them. And do you feel that they, they literally are living a completely different world to you? And they are a little bit out of touch with, with reality. Most of the ones I'm still in touch with have left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're the good guys. But yeah, the others, yeah, there's it's still, you know, PowerPoint slides and traveling and hotels and you know, board meetings and all that and just jumping from one project to the next. Just lots of fluff. It. Lots of fluff. Well, I'm yeah. glad you said that. All right, let's do one more. What do you expect next next in the world of AI? So obviously your your seeds is driven yeah. a lot by by AI tech doesn't have to be related to the car industry, but yeah. what, what do you see next in the world? Because AI is really hitting us. It's hitting all of us yeah. in, in pretty much nearly as every aspect of our, of our life. Have a crystal ball moment. What's going to happen next in the world of AI? I, th I think about that a lot, right? Because we're doing a lot in AI. So I genuinely believe it's, it is the next technology that's going to change the world. Like since the internet came, there hasn't been a, a massive shift as big as this one. You know, when the whole... Web 3.0 and then blockchain and all that came, like I would understand it and then say, am I missing something? Then I would go and read more. I'm like, okay, I actually do get it, but why do people think it's that big? I didn't think it was that big, right? Yeah. And I think if, if I explain blockchain to my grandma, she'd never get it. Yeah. If I go and tell my- you Explain it to me. <laughs> 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 Look, there's probably about 300 people in the world who can actually it. can properly explain blockchain. Exactly. But everyone you know, loves this thing that they can. Then you talk about AI or chat yeah. with you, whatever, you get it. You probably have it yeah. on your phone. You've asked it a few questions. You yeah. get what it can be, right? Yeah. And I think that's what that's that's the key point. It's reached people. It re and people understand. Blockchain it. doesn't reach masses. Correct. Web 3.0 doesn't reach masses, but AI people can, can already start to feel. And the applications in yeah. blockchain are okay about yeah. you know the yeah, history yeah. of a car or person yeah, yeah. or contract, whatever, NFTs and all. But here it's it's like you're everything. impacting directly to everything. the end end customer, the end consumer. Hundred percent. And the place where I think is going to change the world is when it actually stops, not stops, but like it, it moves away from just advising you on how to do things better or creating content for you or whatever yeah. to actually doing the work for you. Yeah. So once it gets integrated into all the software in your life, whether you're a company or a person, where you can say, order the milk, do the flowers, submit my vacation days and do my annual projection for my next year. Yeah. And it does everything, and it's live, and it's this is where it's gonna. So, where does that leave us? I don't think in a bad place. Like, like, like a lot of people worry about, okay, what will humans do, and all that. But with every wave, whether you know people moved from factories, you know, plugging metal stuff together, now a robot does it, and we moved higher in that in that scheme. We'll move higher. We'll we'll like like I was telling my wife also the other day, showed her this clip on AI literally producing a whole video from text. You say, yeah. you know, I want, you know, Luca walking on a beach with a, with a nice hat. Of course, of course you, of course you're thinking <laughs> about six me. pack and yeah, all of that. Yeah. And it can, you know, fakely slap six packs on you. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but like it can do the whole movie, right? So, yeah. and it's a whole movie and you yeah. can do angles and zoom ins and whatever with real people. It's not a cartoon, yeah. right? Wow, this is crazy. She's like, yeah, but this is crazy because then you won't know what's real, what's not, and real actors and all that. I'm like, yes. That's where does it stop, right? Where, where does it stop? Where does it stop and think about the damage it could potentially do? So it will damage some sectors or some, you know, segment of the people. But think about how many people who can make amazing movies right now who can make them because they don't have camera crews and all yeah. that budget and whatever. Yeah 
with this, now they can make amazing yeah. movies, right? Yeah. Like so. Or this podcast, just to automate this entire automate podcast. Automate podcast, yeah, 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 it yeah. won't be real. You'll be just, just, <laughs> two, just two, two, two AI. Robots. And, yeah, two <laughs> talking. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so. Look, it's it's a scary world. Do you, do yeah. you feel do you feel that the world is in a better place now? All right, or you know. Do you feel like our best day, I hate to, I don't want to say this, but are our best days behind us in the sense of human interaction and, and sort of social interactivity? Or do you feel like now we're in a better place because we have tech, because we have AI, it's only going to make the world a better place? I mean, we're, we're, let's take a little bit of a humanitarian view on that. I do think the world's going to be in a better place. I, um, may, maybe I'm naive yeah, an or, or I'm too guy. biased like or no, whatever. Like but we need some optimism. Yeah. No, we need some optimism. I think it's a good thing. I think yeah. it'll it'll take us to the next stage of evolution where you know we'll be doing things we never dreamt of doing before. Yeah. And it'll take us all one level higher in, in the evolution. Will we have more or less human interaction? I don't know. I mean when when you know the whole web three and metaverse came out and whatever, there's a lot of bad talk about it in terms of okay, now we won't see each other and we won't talk anymore. And it's true to, to a large extent. But the flip side of it is if we do want to interact, we had much more options at that point. So historically, you'd say you just had a baby. You would message your aunt over yeah. SMS and say, hey, I just had a baby. Oh, congratulations, whatever. What if you can have your aunt on a, on a, like in, the, in the metaverse with you while you're having like yeah. in certain ways it can I actually... my aunt would be able to understand <laughs> that. Make sure she's there. Like... like so in certain ways, it can actually improve. No, no, she's about 70, so she'll be probably <laughs> buying a Mitsubishi right about now. <laughs> exactly, 72. 72. So she has two more years. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, it can be better in certain ways, but, yeah, it can take away. I mean, right now, most 90% of my meetings are Zoom meetings. I'm yeah. not going physically. I'm meeting people. Yeah. I'm more efficient, all that, but, yeah, I do see less people face-to-face. -face. Maybe I end up saving it for the ones I like more that matter most <laughs> that matter most and you spend the time there so keep the ones arm's length but the exactly. ones that you love bring them closer um so why do, just sort of wrapping up why, why do you do Tariq? why do you do what you do At and really think about it, and really think about that what what you know, what's the reason you get up every single morning and you know you've launched this company why are you doing this i want to make it happen and i started and i'm not going to stop till i can make it happen like i just feel this is something I promised myself I want to take to the next level and I started on it. Sometimes I don't feel like continuing, but yeah. I started and I want to make it happen. And I think, I mean, when we built the first version of the app, yeah. to me it's crazy that we've built something that 2.7 million people used. Like, what? <laughs> and if, like, if you cook a, a chicken dish and two people eat it, you're like, wow, they ate my yeah. dish. Especially right? your chicken. <laughs> it's really my chicken. Your wife told me it's phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah, so, like, but if you make something and 2.7 million people are using it, it's a nice that's feeling. That's impressive. Yeah. It's yeah. a nice feeling. So, is it that, that sort of, that, uh, do you get a, a buzz out of that? I mean, is it, there, is a sort of amount of adrenaline that gives you that yeah. sort of, you know, what is it that feeling that you, that you love so much that achievement, I think, achievement. Like, like feeling that I've achieved something big. Yeah. Like, uh, and it's not financial. It really is yeah. this, this getting something out there. That's a success. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you all the very best. Look, it, it's, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Real pleasure nice. having you, having really you on the show. Fun. I like um, the balls. <laughs> you like the balls, huh? Yeah. By the way, they're proprietary, so don't try and steal <laughs> them, right? Okay, I'll do uh, golf balls instead of ping pong. Do golf balls. I actually do have golf balls. <laughs> oh, it's, really? it's, a, it's, a, it's always a... It's a Why it, did I get the ping pong? Yeah, look, it's a top stop. Oh, either I go ping pong or I go golf. Golf are quite heavy. It could do some yeah. damage with that okay. bag. Uh, but look, real pleasure having you on the show. Thank um, you. Come back again soon. Absolutely. And I wish you all very the very fun. best, mate. All the very best. Thanks. Thanks, Luca.